Folks, welcome to the Solomons, a group of over 900 tropical islands that they've nicknamed the Happy Isles. Sit back and relax, and I'll show you why. Lying east of New Guinea and north of Vanuatu, the independent nation known as the Solomons is the third largest archipelago or group of islands in the entire South Pacific region. Yet it is also one of the most unspoiled. The Solomons is made up of at least 992 individual islands. These range in size from significant land masses with their own mountain ranges, dense rainforests and major river systems down to tiny coral atolls and sand caves lapped by the warm blue waters of the mighty Pacific. The Solomons are sometimes referred to as islands adrift in time, and this is an apt description. Many of this peaceful nation's 250,000 inhabitants still live a traditional Melanesian lifestyle in small custom villages scattered throughout the archipelago. Even in the bigger towns, many Solomon Islanders still live a largely subsistence lifestyle, often supplementing their modest income by selling hand-carved wooden fish and artefacts to visitors. <laughs> the Solomons are also known as the Happy Isles, and it's not hard to see why. Solomon Islanders are amongst the friendliest folk on Earth, and they extend a particularly warm welcome to the small but growing number of tourists who visit this magnificent region each year. Visitors to the Solomons come here to sample the many delights of the local culture and to meet these fantastic people on their own turf. Tourists also come to see the Solomons' breathtaking scenery, learn a little of its fascinating history and to enjoy a host of outdoor activities that include bushwalking, sailing, swimming, snorkeling, scuba diving, and of course, folks, recreational fishing. Typical of the many low-key laid-back destinations to be found throughout the Solomons is the coastal village of Munda. It's at the western end of New Georgia Island. Now, you won't find any air-conditioned five-star class resorts at Munda, but what you will find is Agnes Lodge, a comfortable, homely guest house with a range of lodgings to suit any budget and a simple dining room, folks, that serves fresh local fare. While traditionally catering mostly to keen scuba divers, Agnes Lodge has recently expanded its activities to include estuary, inshore and offshore fishing packages that most visiting anglers will find extremely attractive. Organised tours by sea and road from Munda also take in many scenic, cultural and historic attractions of the region. These include the eerie relics and well-preserved burial sites of nearby Skull Island, some of which date back 300 years to a more savage time of tribal wars and cannibalistic headhunters. Western New Georgia is also littered with relics and reminders of the fierce World War II battles waged here between Allied forces and the occupying Japanese during the early 1940s. We've got uh, a lot of remnants of uh, World War II here. Uh, I mean, Agnes Lodge is actually right on the edge of the airstrip that the Americans built during the Second World War. Um, sometimes we go a little bit further afield. Um, we go and visit an underground clinic that uh, the Japanese built, a tunnel system into the hills at Columbangra. That's really quite interesting, and there's some bits and pieces still there. Um, syringes, morphine vials, um, a kidney-shaped dish, bottles with iodine in that's still there after 50-odd years. Um, we also go and visit a US uh, Stewart tank that's on the island of Kahingu. Um, it's still pretty much intact. You can see bullet holes, which look very much as though the driver was, um, was injured 
um, when, when he was shot. It's a very, very small tank, but unbelievably there was four people uh, in the tank. And there's still a few bullets and shells hanging around, so that's well worth a look if you're into the World War II uh, type of thing. If you crave an even more idyllic and peaceful escape than the charms of Munda, then Hop Eye Island might be just the place for you. Here you can play Robinson Crusoe on your very own deserted island, sleeping in a traditional thatched hut and dining on fresh crayfish and other seafood delights while planning your next fishing trip to the nearby reef edge. After the stories we'd heard about the superb and almost untouched fishing available in these rich tropical seas, Bushy and I could hardly wait to wet a line. Well, folks, an air of excitement just after sunup here in the tropics and the promise of a good day's fishing. And behind us, a river that the locals don't even know about. And we're going to be the first people up there to throw a few lures around. The human broomstick is with me. Where'd you park your camel, Sylvester? No, it's over the back of the dunes there, Rex. Do you get, like me, a little bit pumped up when you come to these new places and the locals say, uh, what sort of lure is that and what are you going to catch? Certainly do, Rex, and I'm uh, hanging to get a lure into that snag there. We have had the promise of some very big mangrove jacks, some pretty archer fish. A lot of you might know them as rifle fish. But it's the anticipation of fishing, and let's get it to our young folk and the people starting off that if it was only catching fish, they'd call it catching and not fishing. Yep, I think uh, today it's going to be a real excitement. Well, Bushy's not learning his lines very well. In other words, he says, get on with it, Rex. So I'll take the cue and we'll get on with it. Thank you very much. No shortage of environment for them, Bushy. No. Ooh. Ooh, that's just how it really looks. Oh, what have we got? It's an archer fish, isn't it? That might be a big one if it is. <laughs> it's a little jack. That's a an huge archer. archer. That is an archer fish. Now, look at the size look of that. This, that is one of the biggest archer fish you've ever seen. We also know them as rifle fish bushy. Yeah, I've never seen one that big. Now, they're quite <laughs> unique. They're like that llama that spits at the Melbourne Zoo. Tell us a little bit about him. Well, they've got a groove, actually, along the top of the top of the mouth, and they shoot insects out of the trees. The reason Rexy got that one, he just cunningly hung the lure over a little branch, and the archer thought it was a rather big insect and grabbed it. So they actually shoot them down. If we can get that out of there for you, Rexy. It's a big one, though. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah, that's one of the biggest ones I've seen. I've never seen one that size. So an archer or a rifle fish? Yeah. Da, 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 da. Remember the old rifleman? <laughs> I tell you what, well, there he goes. Well, that's not a bad start. This, will, this is not going to be easy, is it? No, we're going to have to work, but I think what we get looks like it's going to be big. Quality time here, folks. Get the lure close to the edge of the bank and these particular structures as in this case, tree roots and uh, fallen down branches. And something's going to happen eventually. Oh, this is big fish territory. This is, this is big mangrove jack territory. This is, these are not mangrove jacks, these are mangrove johns. Mangrove giants. Yes. Oh, did you see that? Yeah. Yeah, I did get a... No, it was just a shimmer. It was another one of those little trevally, but we need something to go bang. Not there again. It's a huge school of trevally there. Something big here, though, that made that big... Oh, yeah. Look how thick the bait is. It's just yeah, a thick mass. Thick. It's got to be things there. Unfished waters, pristine condition, something's wrong. 
There's got to be plenty of tucker down there for them and they don't like what I'm giving them. Ooh, what a nice snag over here too. You'd think everything would be right with that bait lock. Oh, bushy, yeah, something grab that. <laughs> yes. I don't, know what it, I don't know what it is, but... Might be another Trevally, is it? Yeah, it's like a Trevally. It's a bit better one. Yeah. I tell you what, he's come by the Cape. A circle. It's just important to get in towards the structures, you know. We're in the middle of this. This is actually Yibbity Yibbity Creek. Now, I've always wanted to fish there with you. <laughs> and uh, this is a beautiful looking Trevally. And what we've got to do is get in close to those structures. And the structures, of course, are the edges of this magnificent mangrove uh, creek. Now, he certainly wanted that, didn't he? He certainly did. He came for the mangrove jacks, but we're just going up the food chain at this particular stage. And I see one of your big eye jobs again, Bushy, yeah, is he? Yeah, a big eye, I think. A big eye. Look at that, just beautiful. Well, Mr Big Eye, just keep my hands clear of all that armoury and let Bushy do the job. So when you're fishing the creeks, folks, you want to make sure you use every little bit to your advantage to catch one of these fine piscatorial friends of ours. Just start thinking like a fish. You're not going to be out here in the middle because you're going to get eaten. You're going to be in there where all of that sort of action is because that's where the bait is because they certainly don't want to be anywhere where there's fish like this to eat them. And the other thing is, oh, gee whiz, that's pretty tough. This is where these big critters are going to be. We'll see you later, mate. And off he goes. Yibbity yibbity creek. Yes, good start. That is not all. There's more to come. Folks, that's the environment we want to be in. It's no good at being out in the middle here and casting away where there's no structure. That's where the mangrove jacks are going to be, because they're hiding from their predators and they're after what they eat. So what we've got to do is be able to get these lures right into the action, just like that, right into this side of the, the fallen uh, timber, beside the, the drop-offs. Don't know what happened there. And I tell you what, one of my favourite cartoon characters was Tweety Pie, because he used to sit on the perch and says, I thought I thought I'd put it can't. But Rexy sits on the perch and says, I think I see a dog. Mate, you are a tadpole short of a swamp. Don't you know there's crocodiles in here? Look at that! <laughs> He's in big time. Go, Rex, what's that one? I don't know what it is. It's a mangrove jack. Yes. No, it's not. It's something. Oh, it's so no, it's not big enough. Jack. It's not big enough, but I'm bushy. I don't know, it hit you hard. It did hit me hard. I, I've only got this little light. It's, it's, a, it's a mangrove jack. It's a jack. Mangrove jack. It <laughs> did hit me hard too. That's what we want. I tell you what, I've only got four kilo line on, and I had to, I had to sort of... Now, he's on the top of a twig there. He's got the tree and all. Now, I've got the... I got. This is where they live, folks. <laughs> Now, Bushy, you can't do any better than this. He's got the tree and all. You can't do any better than this. That's a 50-pound trace on there, Bushy. And we've got to explain to the folks that these are the biggest fighters. There we go. These are the biggest fighters around. And arguably the best eating fish in the mangroves. I think so. Better than barramundi. Better than threadfin salmon. Certainly as Curly from the Three Stooges would say, certainly woo, 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 better than catfish. You're right there. Tell us a little bit about these monsters, because you've been here on a little bit of a wreck trip a couple of months ago, and you ran into some horses, but this is not a bad size. That's a good size, Jack, Rex. Well, these things just live right hard in the covers. You can see Rexy pulled up half of a tree while he was getting him out. You can see the teeth on these things are just ferocious. Get Peter to have a look in there for you at those teeth, and they live right hard against the snags and they'll belt the hell out of anything that comes close. I suppose a lot of people w might have thought that a CD11 
in a Rapala was an overkill for these fish. But I can tell you now, with those teeth and with all the problems, I'm going to go into my tackle box and get my boga grips. Now what happens, this is, for two reasons, I can just grab him like that and he's fine, and I can weigh this fish without hurting him. And folks, we have that close to two and a half pounds in the old scale of mangrove jack on there, it's not funny. So Bushy's got the pliers, and what I might do, well I reckon that might just, I don't want him to kick there, do I? So yeah, he's very, very close. So what happens is, is that if you just take it easy, son, it comes out as simple as that. And those uh, boga grips, well, I got them off Jack Erskine up in Cairns. I think I paid about 300 bucks for them and they were worth every cent. I just hope some enterprising person brings them into Australia and makes them more popular because they're fantastic. To <coughs> a fly. <coughs> Louis the fly. Louis, I hate you. OK, two and a half pounds of mangrove, Jack. We can kiss him and watch yourself, folks. And it's just a matter of putting him back in like that, releasing the boga grip like that, and away he goes. So, uh, yibbity yibbity, mangrove jack in the Solomon Islands. It was worth waiting for, but gee, we've had some cars. Well, here's an interesting little tip for you from the rainforests of the Solomon Islands. You know, the people here in the Solomon Islands often need to navigate through these dark rainforest trails in the dead of night. And I'll tell you what, there's no street lights here, it gets pretty dark. Well, what they do is look for one of these branches that has these unusual little white mushrooms growing on it. Because these mushrooms have a very strange characteristic. They actually glow in the dark. And what the people will do is take just one mushroom head like that, stick it to the back of their neck, and the person walking behind them can see them as a little glowing dot of light. And walking in Indian file, they don't get lost. They can follow the trails safely back to the village. How's that for ingenuity? Well, folks, as darkness falls on another day in paradise, it's time to say yibbity yibbity for this week. However, why don't you join us next week at the same time for our continuing jaunt through the Solomon Islands. In the meantime, I'm Big Rex. This is The Bush. Good fishing to you all. Folks, I think it was Lucky Strike who sang, I've been everywhere, man. Well, I haven't been to the Solomon Islands, but I know a bloke that has, and I'm here now, folks. This, of course, is paradise. There's no doubt about it. And David Cook is from Solomon Sea Charters. Well, it's good to see you. Welcome to Rex Sun Show. Nice to have you here, Rex. This is beautiful. How long have you been here? Six years. Have you? Where'd you yeah. come from? Came from England originally, yeah. I'd have yeah. never known it. Bad luck in the cricket, eh? <laughs> Thanks. Now, why the Solomons? It's a long way from Oxford Street in London. Yeah, it certainly is. I was sort of travelling around really since about 1985, and uh, one thing led to another. I just was in the right place at the right time to open a, a dive shop in the Solomons, and we've been doing diving and fishing ever since. Not many casinos and resorts and not much development. It, it seems rather pristine for an area that I found quite easy to find. Yeah, it's surprising, the unknown, even in Australia where it, it's only, what, three hours flight away? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Now, we're doing a bit of trolling with our trusty skipper Tusker. Uh, what can we expect this afternoon? I believe a change of tide, wind against the tide, and the condition's not too bad at all. No, not too bad, um, particularly when we're trolling these small lures, we can expect to pick up coral trout, red bass, uh, Spanish mackerel, bluefin trevally, and maybe even giant trevally. Half of that would be OK, folks. <laughs> A couple of CD11 Rapalas down the back. Let's see how we go. Even if we don't get a fish, 
Just nice being here, isn't it, David? Beautiful spot. I loved you too in that band with the dreadlocks. I thought they were fantastic. What was the song you sang again? I'll think about it later on. I'll hum the tune. Fantastic. I wish I could do that. <laughs> no hope. Traditional than that, just <laughs> dug out of a yeah. bit of wood. Yeah. Stop and grab that just by the reef, folks. What a beautiful part of the world, the Solomon Islands. I really only knew it because it was on the map, but I tell you what, until you come to these places, you don't realise how beautiful they are. And so many of us judge places like this when we first land at the, the main areas where all the people are and they're lovely don't get me wrong but it's not until you get out to these magnificent pristine areas and fish for beautiful fish like this cod that you really understand what's going on now what did I say then that was a cod but I think it might be some sort of trout is it David yes yeah, a coral trout a yeah. coral trout I saw his big mouth and I thought, gee, he's got a mouth bigger than Rex Hunt. And uh, that fish there, David, is absolutely an assassin pack. He apparently lives down around the Bomboras and the coral. You're a yeah. diver, you know yeah. more than what I know about him. Tell the folk a little bit about it. Yeah, well, basically what they do, they sit down in their hole and they must be, they always look very sort of lazy fish, but they must accelerate out of the hole very, very quickly because we're trolling that lure a few metres off the reef and he's just out. And he's got it. That's why we have to fish a fairly heavy drag because otherwise he'll be back in the hole and, and away. A pretty fish. Look at the beautiful colours. That's almost a cobalt blue. And that gob there, not for kissing, folks. Have a look at that. <laughs> Just a little bit of a peck <laughs> on the side. A little bit of Rexy zinc. And as some of the natives give us a little bit of a wave, this is not a bad start, folks. The Solomon Islands, I think I can get to like this place. Thank you very much. Off you go, mate. When you're angling, you must understand your terminal tackle, in this case, the lures and their action. And if the rod's not vibrating and the line's not really pulling with a great deal of strength, the lure's not working. In this case, the Rapalas have got a bib. It work against, works against the force of the water, which makes the lure wriggle, which is very tantalising to fish. And more importantly, it gets down to the depth where the fish are feeding. You might have 30 feet of water here. If you're only under two feet from the surface, you've got 28 feet that's not working for you. So make sure your gear is finely tuned. And when a fish hits, you'll be ready for him. That'll be very interesting, because uh, you know we do the jacks in the rivers, we do this light trolling. One, oh, there we go, Tusco. Tell you what, he grabbed that, didn't he? <laughs> he grabbed that at 100 mile an hour. As I said before, folks, what a magnificent place. And something's grabbed this Rapala. What we're doing is we've been trolling at about oh, 1,500, 2,000 revs for those people who understand outboard engines. But for the uninitiated, about five or six knots, which is, you know, about your six or seven miles an hour. And we've picked up another something that has grabbed the lure. So he's not given up much now, but he gave me a little bit earlier on. I'll tell you what, I can take a lot of this, folks. This is just, oh, this is the bee's knees. This one, don't worry about that. So, oh yeah, what we've got here. Now, 
David, you're going to have to help me. I reckon that's some sort of a mackerel, is it? It is, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't actually know what the what particular type of mackerel that is. Well, it's certainly it's some. A, it's like not a, a bad. Mackerel it's type. not a bad mackerel. No. But he's been hit yeah. by something by there. By a shark. By a shark, do you think? I'd say. Yeah. Okay. You see, he's been nailed further back yeah, and around yeah. there as oh, well. Gee, he has. I'll just get him there and just show the folks that that is the law of the land. This bloke, he won't have much chance, I tell you now, unless he's really in with some luck. So what I might do is just get him back as he's actually bleeding. Yeah. So I think, I think what we might do at this particular stage, folks, is that we're going to set up a burly trail later on. I'll hand that over to David and just tell you, this is Rex Hunt Fishing Adventures. Folks, I think I'll rename it Rex Hunt Fishing in Paradise. I'll be back after the break. Tell you what, wow, whatever was on there is now gone, now gone, and that was a fair fish. What I was going to tell you that you wouldn't have been able to see is that Peter was just going to do a bit of a stand up with me, and I was going to say that trolling is just not carting bits of metal and wood along, hoping that a fish commits suicide. Now, our skipper, Tasker, is working diligently and very, very meticulously two years ago I didn't even know what that meant folks but it sounds good to me along the edges of the reef because during the day when the sun is at its highest these ambushing fish are underneath the cover and that's what we all need we need cover and we need food when something like that Rapala goes glittering past she's all over she said waving her wooden leg and at this stage I got done and I don't like it so I'll just check my lure to see if there's no teeth marks in it and more importantly, to see that it still swims properly. There's no teeth marks in it. Yes, there is. Now, have a look at this. Now, there is a tooth mark. Peter will be able to get right in there. That's a tooth mark. And at the back, we have other teeth marks and the lure is starting to come away at the back. Now, that has been one hellish and nice fish, folks. So our skipper, he's doing the old U-turn, folks. I tell you what, talk about your eyes popping. We're going to get back in here and see what was in here that made a heck of a mess of that Rapala. Hmm. It's got me tossed. I'll see if it swims now again. We've just got to check this sort of stuff. And it's swimming okay now. That'll be okay. Yeah, that'll go off all right. Now, if I'm not seeing things, I reckon that might have been a mackerel. Yeah, so I think what I'm me doing by me checking with a deep pinnacle low area, then by look up go side low wind, go side go for how for by him fitting low black and straight or oh, nine. Yeah. Okay. M9. Oh, that's a bit of a touch. Something grabbed that, and it still grabbed it. <laughs> just get the ratchet off this, and get Tusker to just sort of pull it back a little bit. I've got a bit of strain on the... Okay, <laughs> let's get a bit of line back. Now, these level winds are good on these Calcutta's that I'm using, because I don't have to worry about sort of threading the line on. It just does it beautifully for me, and... As you can see quite clearly, it lays it on just beautifully on the spool and you can cast it out or let it out when you're trolling again and you don't get many sort of foul-ups. So we've got a little bit of a runner out there. This could be some sort of mackerel, I think. Where are we? There he is. Oh, look, this is a nice mackerel. I tell you what, this is a barred mackerel. Now, that's a nice fish. That is a nice fish. That's a small Spaniard. I thought he was a barred. He's a small Spaniard. Would you agree with that, David? Yep, that's fine. A small, a small Spanish, Spanish mackerel. mackerel. Sure is. Now, we're under big instructions back there that we're going to have a lovely feed of fresh fish, folks. We sure are. So, 
There'll be no kissing on this particular shoot, and if you don't mind, I won't kiss you. <laughs> but folks, the Solomon Islands, Spanish mackerel. Ole. Falatau Leve is Munda's answer to the bush tucker man. He takes visitors deep into the local rainforest to show them some of its most intimate and best kept secrets. In an age when we are just beginning to recognise and embrace some of the hidden riches of the rainforest, including traditional medicines and miracle cures, to Falatau they're an open book and he obviously enjoys sharing them with visitors. Yeah, this is uh, Rob. I'm telling you about it. Ah. When you go along a bush and you accident, this one will stop your bleed. Stops the bleeding? Very quick. Just pour it on the, on the wood? Pour it on the, on the wood and it's... Fantastic. Medicines like that just growing here in the rainforest. It's absolutely wonderful. Next, Falatau shared with me a little trick that I really look forward to trying back home. First, he hacked a section from a handy termite's nest. Then, moving quietly to a nearby jungle stream, Falatau tossed the nest and its tiny occupants onto the swirling waters. <laughs> Talk about a great way of finding out if there are any hungry fish around. Uh, let's come with me and I'll uh, tell you about rainforest, where we have our, our deep sea fishing line. This is some uh, small sizes, size O, size 1, size 2. This is some size 100, <laughs> 200 test along here. And everywhere Hemikarem, different sizes. <laughs> so this is Falatau's tackle shop. This is yes, where you come to yes, get your fishing gear. Yes. This is amazing, fishing lines growing on trees. And they use these as drop lines to fish in quite deep water. Now, if you think this is remarkable, we're going to move along a little bit further and find nature's equivalent of gel spun polyethylene, one of the strongest fibres I've ever seen growing right here on a tree. Let's go and find that fella, Tal. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, they don't call this rainforest for nothing, and it's pouring down at the moment. But luckily, there are leaves in this forest that you can use for almost anything, from building houses to making temporary umbrellas. And it's working like a charm. It's keeping the water off me. Now all I have to do is find Falatau, and he tells me that he's got some even more surprising things to show me that grow right here in the rainforests of Munda. He's down there somewhere. Oh, there you are, Falatau. Uh, yeah. <laughs> This is a burning leaf that we're going to oh, tell you about. burning leaf, yes. <laughs> you know, it's incredible. When the American and Japanese soldiers were fighting in this jungle during the Second World War, they didn't have too many of the comforts of home. And when nature called, they had to find a leaf to use as toilet paper. But if they grabbed this particular one, they were in for a nasty shock because this leaf is covered with a substance that creates a very strong burning sensation that can last for up to a week. That's why Falatau has actually handed it to me with its stem wrapped in another leaf. Fortunately, there's a substance in the very same plant, a sap found towards the bottom of the stalk, which you can rub on and it takes the burning away. Although I don't think too many of the Japanese and American soldiers knew about that. There are leaves here you can use for all sorts of purposes, but you have to know the right one for the right use. But now it was time to track down the surprise that Falatau had been promising me. A high-tech fishing line, Solomon Island style. This is the fishing line rock. Uh, and now we try to show them how we make him. Then we cut him shell for ah. walk him. Walk him. This is the one. This is the amazing stuff that I was telling you about before that has virtually the strength of gel spun polyethylene fishing line, one of the most modern and sophisticated materials we use today. And it's actually a fibre out of the bark of this particular vine. And the locals here in the Solomons take the strands of it and roll it and twist it together and come up with this immensely strong line. They go out to sea and catch big skipjack tuna, even yellowfin and things on this line. It's just incredible that it grows right here in the forest. Show me how you uh, cut it up, Felta. Huh? 
You're using your shorts so the hairs don't get caught, eh? Yes. <laughs> Usually women yeah, this do this? Is women work job for a woman. Because they haven't got so many hairs on no, the legs. No, my hair, long, <laughs> long leg. <laughs> Show me the, oh, that's fantastic. And there we go, fellow towers braided or woven it together into a very strong piece of line. There's no way I can break that. That's the Happy Isles. It is the Happy Isles, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yibbity yibbity time, folks. We've enjoyed our stay. And do yourself a favour. Get over here. They're magnificent people in a lovely country. In the wonderful world of fishing, I'm Rex Hunt. Goodbye for now.